And we will be starting shortly. Um, as you can see from our from presentation, we're going to let Layla take it away from the beginning here once everyone's settled in. Yep, looks like people are coming in um, as we get going. But um, as we're as we're getting people in, I thought I would just take a moment and I'll introduce um, our speaker, Layla. So I um, want to welcome everybody. Um, as we had just mentioned, uh, Dee Dee is not here right now. She's traveling. So um, you're going to have Leslie and I, um, but we are delighted to have Layla George, who is the president and CEO of the Louisville Olmstead Parks Conservancy with us. Um, obviously, I live in Louisville too, so I get to benefit from the gorgeous parks that she oversees. Um, and she's a Louisville native who has joined the Olmstead Parks Conservancy in 2018. Um, in 2022, she was named to the Louisville Business Journal Enterprising Women's List. Um, so we're really great, um, glad to welcome her during Women's History Month so we can hear from the wonderful things that the Olmstead Parks Conservancy has been doing. They were founded over 30 years ago and they have 17 Olmstead Parks and six parkways. Um, today, she's going to be discussing Chickasaw Park, which is celebrating its 100th birthday this year. And it has a really interesting, but also difficult history. Um, you may have recalled that um, another open exchange meeting we heard from Sarah Cedar Miller um, on uncovering the layers of Central Park um, in her new book, Before Central Park. Um, in much of the same way, Layla and her team are uncovering the many layers of park history that we have here in Louisville. So she's going to talk about that a little bit today, and then she'll take some questions. Uh, okay. Great. So take it Thank away, you. Layla. I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen now. Okay, you can see my screen now, I assume. Chickasaw Park. Yes. So one of the advantages that I get from this network and the Friday meetings that we do is the opportunity to connect with each other and learn about your various organizations to find out what others are doing so that we can reach out to each other for advice and help. So in the spirit of sharing, I'm going to start by telling you just a little bit about our organization and our park system. So our mission is to enhance, restore, and protect Louisville's Olmstead Design Parks and Parkways, connecting nature and neighborhood while strengthening our community's well-being. Frederick Law Olmstead visited Louisville in 1891. He was invited by local leaders to design a park system. This will be the final park system that he ever designs with large anchor parks in the west, south, and east. You can see those uh, depicted in this image here. We have Shawnee in the western edge of Louisville. It's along the Ohio River and the most formal of our parks. It's 300 acres in what is now predominantly an African-American neighborhood, about six minutes from downtown, a true oasis. Cherokee Park is also just a few minutes from downtown, but in the other direction. This is in the east end of town. It's about 400 acres, and this view on the left is one of the most iconic Olmstedian pastoral vistas that we have. The neighborhood around Cherokee is the most affluent of all of our parks and predominantly white. Iroquois Park is the largest. It's almost 800 acres plus a 300 or so acre golf course. It's in the south end of town, which is now the most diverse neighborhood in the entire city with tons of immigrants and refugees from Asia, Africa, and Central America. This is considered a mountainous park and is the second highest location in our city. We've got great vistas, beautiful woodlands, and a really nice prairie on the top of the park. Of course, what makes our park system a system are the parkways. We have six in total, which connect these large parks and form a ring around the urban core. You can see in this map that uh, Olmstead had the three anchor parks. I don't know if you can see my mouse. We've got Cherokee here in the east, Shawnee in the west, and then Iroquois down in the south. And then his son, John Charles Olmstead, took over this project when Flo retired and filled in with smaller neighborhood parks in the urban core. In total, we have 17 Olmstead design parks and six parkways totaling about 2,200 acres and 15 miles of roadway. Our organization was founded in 1989 in response to some major threats to our parks. 
Cherokee Park was hit with a devastating tornado in 1974. You can see that image in the upper left. The bottom image is A64, the federal highway uh, project cut through Cherokee and Seneca a few years before that. And neighbors near Cherokee wanted the city to do more to bring Cherokee back to life and were very frustrated with the slow pace. They petitioned our mayor and he used Central Park Conservancy in New York as a model and our organization was born. Friends of Olmstead Parks recognized that the value is not just in Cherokee, but in the system as a whole. In Louisville, we partner with Louisville Parks and Recreation. They own all of our parks. They're responsible for all the basic maintenance. And then we come in and add an extra layer of care. Capital improvements is really um, kind of the heart and soul of what we do. We've been doing this for 34 years, raising private dollars matched with city funding, most but not all the time. When it comes to capital investments like pavilions, playgrounds, sports courts, et cetera. Ecological restoration is where our team really shines. <clears throat> we have about seven people who focus their energies here. We also work with local universities and research projects that guide our work. And we have a team of about 100 specially trained park stewards who work in their specific area independently. The third component of our work is community engagement and advocacy. This could be things like group volunteer projects, fun community events like the beer garden here in the middle, or just neighborhood gatherings in our parks. Our volunteer program is very successful. <clears throat> we have a lot of school and corporate groups, and then of course these wonderful park stewards that really enable us to accomplish far more than we ever could, have our, could on our own. A lot of our events focus on supporting the neighbors and park users with their events. We've learned we don't need to do everything ourselves, so we often look for ways to support others who are programming and activating our parks. Lastly, who we serve. Who are our park users? As our parks are in the urban core, <clears throat> our park users are more diverse than the city as a whole. Twice as many Black residents are park users and live near Olmstead Parks compared to the rest of the city. A lot of these populations have uh, less access to vehicles, significantly lower household income, lower educational attainment, et cetera, which really makes our work to improve the conditions and access to the parks critical. That also holds true in Chickasaw. <clears throat> here again is a map of our park system. Here is Chickasaw Park down here. So it's in the far Western edge of town, just South of Shawnee Park. To frame the conversation and um, start talking about Chickasaw, it's important to start with segregation. <clears throat> so, Segregation was really starting to bubble up in Louisville in the early 1900s. On weekends and holidays, it really was not uncommon for black and white people to be seen in Louisville's public parks, picnicking and playing basketball together side by side. Blacks used as public swimming pools and tennis courts as well. But in October of 1911, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> racial, te racial tensions began to rise and the West End Improvement Club requested the Parks Board to ban Negroes from Shawnee Park. At this point, there was still a significant white population in the West End of town. That was denied, but then eventually they uh, relented and Shawnee Park had a playground designated for colored fellow citizens. Cherokee and Iroquois soon followed suit. Racial tensions continued to rise, and in April 6, 1916, the Parks Board received a request from Black citizens for more adequate colored parks and playgrounds. A few parks were built for Black families, and then finally, the city administration's views had devolved regarding park segregation, and in 1925, bowing to pressure from the white community, the Parks Board officially segregated the parks in Louisville. That environment is what led to the development of Chickasaw Park. Chickasaw was formally declared as a park for black citizens in June of 1922. There really were mixed feelings about this. A lot of black leaders felt that by accepting Chickasaw Park, they were accepting segregation. At the time of Chickasaw's founding, it was the largest park land available to blacks, about half of the total. So the first job once they had, um, purchase a land was to find a name for the land. A lot of the parks in Louisville had been named after native tribes. So the parks commissioners reached out to the Smithsonian Institute to find a suitable name for this new park. Chickasaw was recommended because of the positive reputation of the tribe and the euphonious sound to the name. 
Next, the Board of Park Commissioners asked the Olmstead firm to design a park. Chickasaw Park is about 70 acres. The land was purchased by the Board of Park Commissioners in 1923, and you can see the uh, three main parcels here on this map. The Olmstead firms really developed a beautiful plan for Chickasaw Park. We believe that this is the only park designed by the Olmstead firm during the period of segregation, specifically for use by African Americans. The original plan called for a new shelter house, swimming pool, tennis courts, ball fields, and a wading pool. You can see in this image the Ohio River is on the north, and they really called out the vistas. So you can see these little arrows kind of pointing in a variety of ways. So they really wanted to take advantage of the beautiful river view there at Chickasaw. Unfortunately, at the time, the Board of Parks Commissioners sort of ran out of money um, and was not able to execute the park as designed by the Olmstead firm due to a lack of funding. Chickasaw was really like a lot of other parks for Blacks at the time, kind of low on amenities. And while it didn't have much, it certainly had more than any other park available to Blacks in Louisville at the time. They had a road built through the park and they used an existing building and modified it for current use and had bathrooms and also this um, portico so that people could escape the weather. We then had uh, a lake for canoeing and skating that was completed in 1936. In 1934, the community asked for four more tennis courts. This concrete bandstand that you see there that was constructed in 1943, but it's no longer in existence, and more comfort stations. There were six tennis courts at that time for an estimated 50,000 Blacks using the parks. Tennis at the time was one of the favorite sports and the courts at, Chickana at Chickasaw hosted a lot of regional tournaments. 1937, Louisville was hit with a huge flood. Um, it has been described by many as an inund inundation of almost biblical proportions. The entire Ohio River Valley was impacted by these rising floodwaters, really with the greatest devastation occurring in Louisville. Over the course of 23 days, the Ohio River crested at 57.15 feet above flood stage. As a result, 60% of the city of Louisville was underwater. As you can see in this photo on the right, this is the Shawnee and Chickasaw neighborhoods, totally underwater. After the waters receded, many white residents left the West End and moved to higher ground in the East End of town. This was called white flight. Shortly thereafter, the Parks Board approved plans in 1938 for a flood wall. It would go through the whole city to protect from flooding, but really it was going to impact Shawnee and Chickasaw significantly. The Olmstead firm, of course, disagreed with this, with this decision and told the mayor that Chickasaw and Shawnee Park would both be greatly affected by it. But the design had been approved, there was considerable pressure from the public, and so the wall was built. Louisville's flood wall through Chickasaw Park was completed in 1947, and the park was essentially split in two. You can see in the image on the right, that's, the, um, that's where the flood wall exists now. So it really is splitting the park in two. And this is what it looks like. It's been buried, so it looks like um, Charles Birnbaum said it looked like a big giant worm crawling through the park um, underground. One question I had when I came here was why hire the Olmstead firm? Um, if this was a period of segregation, why would Louisville hire the greatest landscape architect architecture firm in the country to design Chickasaw Park? So there's a um, scholar and Kentuckian historian, George Wright, who wrote a really marvelous book called Life Behind the Veil. And he talked about it's a social contract construct in which whites in the Jim Crow South practiced a, quote, polite form of racism. In Wright's view, whites take on a paternalistic stance towards Blacks by providing just enough to, quote, say they did, while at the same time not really providing enough to make much of a difference or change anything. This is sort of a parallel to what happened after the 1937 flood. You see this image on the right, world's highest standard of living with this happy white family and a beautiful car and a row of African-Americans standing in a food line waiting for food after the flood. So it really is a stark contrast between white America and black America. 
The other um, theory is that Louisville was trying to attract Blacks who were leaving the South during the Great Migration. So 6 million or so African Americans left the Jim Crow South to find opportunity. Louisville wanted to attract these workers and tried to entice them to stop in Louisville and not go up to Chicago or St. Louis by offering amenities such as Chickasaw Park and the beautiful branch of the Western Library, which is a Carnegie Library in the West End of town. Though the city park system was being expanded and improved upon, Black citizens were still limited to only five parks. These five parks combined only at 150 acres with half of that being Chickasaw Park. Black citizens groups requested the use of the entire park system in 1939. They requested more recreational facilities in 1941. Both were denied. Beginning in the late 40s and continuing through the 50s, park usage really did increase dramatically. Chickasaw Park was the place to be for company picnics, family gatherings, summer programs. Picnics and reunions were so commonplace that in the year 1953, several changes came to the park. The use of Chickasaw Park had increased to the extent that something had to be done to accommodate the large numbers of people visiting the park. Bids for a new parkway shelter were opened and one-way traffic on the park road was initiated in 1953. As the Louisville population spent more and more time in the parks and segregation was still being enforced, the, the Black population was seriously overcrowding the available parks. Finally, in 1955, the city parks were officially integrated. Tragedy hit the park in 1950 when the original park lodge burned down. They built a new park lodge building, which um, still stands today. You see it on the right. The new lodge was really met with considerable, considerable opposition because it uh, appeared to be private or for re reservation only, which honestly is a complaint we still hear today. It wasn't open. It wasn't easy access. They couldn't really get out of the weather with a low porch compared to the previous building that was on the site. But it was beautiful. This is the inside of the lodge the day that it opened and was celebrated with the public. It had nice furniture. It had beautiful light. Um, and while the amenities may have been nice, however few, the reality of redlining was stark, as was the case in many American cities. Neighborhoods with high rates of African Americans were also home to industrial sites. Chickasaw was no exception, and today the area around the park is known as Rubber Town because of all the chemical manufacturing plants. You can see in this photo, the one on the right kind of shows all of Chickasaw Park, and you can see some of the tanks, and then here on the left, you see a more complete picture of what's there. It's Dow Chemical Plant, and it's there to this day, but it shares a very thin border with Chickasaw Park. So despite the environmental racism, that hasn't stopped Chickasaw from being a hub of activity. Whether it was concerts, family reunions, Chickasaw has always been the place to see and be seen for decades. In, in uh, 2021, the Trust for Cultural Landscape Foundation featured Chickasaw Park in their landslide awards. Here is a video they produced that I wanted to share with you. Fingers crossed it works. You know, my father would go very bad in the car and go to school and go to Chickasaw Park and go to Saturday for my son. And when I go, and I would be amazed how packed it would be. It was always fun. One thing that really struck me when I came to work at the Conservancy was the fact that the Olmstead Farm is designed on Chickasaw Park, which in Louisville is famous for its strong history in the um, African American community here. It was designed during the period of segregation, especially for the use of African Americans. It always surprised me that the city, during the time of segregation, when we were denying so much to Black Louisvillians that we would hire the preeminent landscape architecture firm in the country. It is on a park floor. I think fascinating one of the is that it's several rooms. Oh, she was on the roof. That, I'm saying, it says, it says how to go again. So, we have a little bit of a room. Glass, two glass in the bottom room. And then to get to the room, we have to climb down the hill, it's like a giant. It's like a journey down, down to the woods to get to the river. And it looks like this. 
<laughs> I think that is such a great video. Um, so a little bit about what, what, what the park looks like today. Um, here's the beautiful Chickasaw Pond. There's a dedication from um, our previous mayor, Jerry Abramson, dedicating that bridge and walkway to all those whose vision and acts of courage helped create a more just and equal society. Building on the bottom left is that big um, facility that was developed to create a space when there were so many events. So that was built in kind of the early 50s as well to accommodate all the large gatherings. The lodge uh, in about the 80s, sometime in the early 80s, the windows and doors were replaced. And you can see it does not look very welcoming. I mean, the image on the right has this really welcoming sign for a family reunion, and it looks like a prison with the gates and bars. So one of our projects this year is to restore this uh, facility and that will include replacing windows and doors so that it can be more welcoming for all of the people that use it. The people on the park, uh, West Louisville Tennis Club has been in Chickasaw Park for a hundred years. Since the park has been there, West Louisville Tennis Club has been there. And we have tried a lot of pop-up events in all of our parks to activate the parks but nothing compares to having a strong user base like we have here in Chickasaw Park. The entire park feels different, more welcoming, safer because of the presence of this group of individuals. Here we have a great photograph of Donnie Johnson, the acting head of the club. The West Louisville Tennis Club offers tennis clinics for youth in the summer. They have senior leagues playing really from March through October. Um, Chickasaw Park is the only public clay courts in the city, and I think it's probably one of a very small number of places in the country that have free public clay courts in the U.S. I have another um, short video. We'll see if I can get this to play. This is Aretha, who is the board president of the West Louisville Tennis Club and a longtime partner. Layla, can you try to turn the volume up? Yeah. That's as loud as I can get it. Thank you. In, in your sh sharing options, you should be able to share sound so that we can all hear it as you hear it. Oh. You all see this? Yeah, in your, where the green triangle is for share screen, mm -hmm. there should be a little triangle next to that. Mm, this one? Uh, I still see the settings. 
Yes. What, where do you think I need to look? On my screen at the bottom where it says share screen, you know how you click to share your uh, presentation? Mm -hmm. There should be a little arrow next to that where you should see, see the option to share sound. Okay, see if this. That's a little tennis club. That was perfect. Thank you. Okay. It's, yeah. it's oh, not thank you. about us. It's about um, community. It's about uh, creating options where people can maintain their health, you know, giving these kids an outlet, exposure to things that they've never seen before. Because you don't know what you're capable of doing if you've never been exposed to anything. So that's what we do. We expose these kids to let them know this is what you could be if you want to be it. We're an organization. We've been around and in Chickasaw Park for 100 years. That would be in 2023. So uh, this part, this part means so much to West Louisville Tennis Club because it's always been our home. And the interesting fact is, it was the only only home we could have in the 1920s. So that history, we're trying to keep it going. For a race of people to not be able to go to a certain park because of their color, that was our reality in 1923. This was the only park that we could go to. So the history of this park means so much because there are legends that have actually played on this court. You know, people like Athea Gibson, you know, people like uh, um, Arthur Lai Johnson, who we honor every year through his tournament. You know, um, it's important to preserve the history so that people can appreciate the change. Just imagine if this park wasn't available to us at that time. I guess he's been running in the streets, right? <laughs> but that's part of our good heritage, you know? And it means a lot. It means a lot. It's a beautiful park, and I'm so glad that we have the honor of using it. It's one of my favorite places to be. So that's Aretha. So what's next for Chickasaw Park? Well, in one word, money. A lot of money is coming to Chickasaw Park. Two and a half million of American Rescue Plan funding is going to go towards restoring Chickasaw Park Pond, dredging it, expanding it. We have almost half a million dollars for a new natural playground, 200,000 for new sidewalks, half a million dollars for restoring the lodge, 650,000 for a new multimodal path that will go along Southwestern Parkway, $700,000 from the Army Corps of Engineers for a riverbank stabilization project and $40,000 for a pollinator meadow. That's over $5 million that's coming to this park, which is long overdue, much needed, and much appreciated. One of my favorite projects is something that's going to honor Chickasaw Park's most famous user, Louisville's most famous son, Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali, of course, grew up in Louisville, just a couple blocks from Chickasaw Park and used to train there. And in Ali fashion, came there after winning the gold medal from the 1960 Olympics in his full Olympic outfit with a gold medal around his neck just to run a few laps around Chickasaw Park and make sure everyone saw. Him. So we had a park user who said they um, had an idea for a butterfly and bee garden to honor Ali. Well, of course, we do butterfly and bee gardens all the time with pollinator meadows. So we've developed a plan. It's going to uh, coincide with the expansion and restoration of the pond project, but be a really beautiful pollinator meadow to honor Ali. And we have support from the Garden Club of Glenview in Louisville and the Garden Club of America for that project, which is exciting. So I want to um, thank you all for listening. Chickasaw Park was founded during a really dark period of our nation's history. It has certainly suffered from a lack of investment over the years, but the future does look bright for this park that is near and dear to so many in our community. I want to recognize Joanne Weeder, who was a local historian and put together a really nice research project on Chickasaw Park. And I got a lot of the material um, from her for this. So with that, I want to thank you and see if there's any questions you all have. Feel free to unmute yourself and just ask questions, or if you'd prefer, um, you can put them in the chat and Leslie and I can ask for you. So any questions you all have for Layla? OK, 
Hey, well, oh, I see Sarah has a question. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, I uh, took me a minute to find the unmute. <laughs> I got a phone call during the program, so I might have missed this. But, uh, apologies if I did. How many staff do you have? This is quite an impressive yes. program. How big is your organization? There are 16 of us. And our annual budget is about 1.7 million for operating. And then we usually spend about two to 3 million a year for capital projects. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Layla for this uh, wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. I've been there a bunch as Layla knows, but I learned a lot just now, I learned more. And uh, I appreciate your colleagues having done this uh, historical research that you've relied on. Yeah. I also basically, uh, I, I expect most people on this call today have spent some time in Louisville. Uh, I have been there a bunch and thanks to Layla, I was there again just this past October and uh, she gave me a wonderful tour of several of the parks, including including Chickasaw. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, I was already learning about the big capital improvement plans then and the huge budget that you have, which is fantastic. Yeah. that you were able to secure all this funding for these ongoing improvements that have barely even started, unless I'm mistaken. Right. But I also, I also just wanted to say, uh, well, as some people on this call know, I, I have been going around the country and examining a lot of the Louisville park systems around the country and uh, paying attention not just to capital improvement plans, but also to programming and, and park activation. And I also wanted to commend Layla on that because, uh, as she knows, I, I, I did see some ex extraordinarily wonderful, lively <laughs> programming going on in a couple of the parks when I visited last year. And uh, so nice to see them um, being used by a diverse population and mm -hmm. uh, really making the most of it. And her organization does specifically some wonderful programming to bring all these folks together. Uh, Layla, what is the name of the smaller pocket park that, where you had the improvements to the trails and tennis courts and so forth? Tyler, that was Tyler. Tyler, Tyler yeah. forgive me. Yeah. I always forget the name of that park, but th that was a discovery for me. For anyone who's not been to Louisville in recent years, when you go and visit all the parks, be sure to visit Tyler Park. It's a precious ju little jewel mm -hmm. kind of hidden in there. So uh, that's my neighborhood park. I live right across the street. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. So uh, I just no hard questions here. Just just some positive information sharing for everyone on the call. Thank you, Larry. You bet. Um, Io, I see your hand up. Yes. Hi, I'm in Detroit. So hello. Um, thank hello. you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I have two questions. I think one comes um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to pose it. So I know that obviously with the names of the parks, my, I guess my question is around, has there been any call to rename them? Obviously the relationship with the park seems to be a positive one with the communities, but I'm just curious, one, if there's been any call to rename them and if so, how do you all navigate that? And then I guess similar to that, have you noticed any sort of unexpected social change um, based on the investment and relationship that you all have had with the parks. Sure, thank you. Um, so the naming, we haven't had any calls to rename any of the parks, but we get a lot of questions about how they came to be. Um, I think there's a misconception that Iroquois Park is where Iroquois Indians were, or Cherokee Park is where Cherokee Indians were, which isn't necessarily the case. Um, I think probably in Detroit, maybe certainly in some of the other Olmstead parks, there's another Seneca park somewhere. So there's other parks around the country that had that habit of naming parks after native tribes. Um, we haven't received any questions about changing any of that. Um, so we don't have any intention necessarily to do that. In terms of the reaction to the funding, people are really excited. I mean, it is, it is a, a long overdue and Louisville's parks are underinvested across the board, um, whether it's capital investment, deferred maintenance, programming, things like that. There just used to be a lot more that the city was able to do. Um, this is nice to have it all kind of come together at once. A lot of time, a lot of these projects are all separate 
um, funded from different sources, uh, but it's all coming together at one time, which is just gonna make a tremendous impact there in the park. Um, the next thing we're trying to do is to raise funds in addition to everything I talked about to redo the tennis courts for the West Louisville Tennis Club because um, they deserve it. They're so awesome. And we really wanna do everything we can to support these super user groups because they do more to take care of that park and make it a great, safe, welcoming place than anything we could ever do. So we wanna do everything we can to support them. So. Thank you. Yeah. Karen. Hi, Layla. Hey so there. I'm sorry, I'm uh, a little under the weather today, so I'm sparing everyone my, like, <laughs> you know, puffy nose and everything. Um, but I, I, well, I guess also had the, I, you know, did not know the system and I had the opportunity of visiting it a few years ago and I am so fortunate in learning about your organization and I still am so inspired by your, your mm -hmm. truck with the acorn on the side of it that everyone loves. <laughs> I talk about it all the time and it has inspired some of some of our we have a watering truck now that we that I, I think kind of came a little bit from um, getting inspired by your energy. So nice. I agree. With that. Um, so I, I, I think my main question, I mean, you know, I'm an architect and a city planner. I've been salivating about these, you know, this WPA era that we're reentering for a long time. I um, there's certain, pro, you know, some age how do I say this? It's been frustrating to watch how slow the wheels have turned or just the lack of, of um, the lack of, of, of um, capacity that a lot of our public park agencies have had because they've been so underfunded that they haven't been able to, to react or plan or be proactive about so much of this quote infrastructure dollars and our projects in some ways are bigger bang for buck than a bridge or a highway or you know, and, and I just feel like parks should be so far up there. And I'm now on the board of the City Parks Alliance. And believe you me, this is what we talk about and what, what I'm going to DC to lobby to, uh, <clears throat> how do I say it, uh, talk to people about in a couple of weeks. But um, but I, I, my question, I mean, I'm asking you, you obviously were really successful. We've been successful in some things, but I was wondering who did you find were your most successful champions? Was it elected officials? Was it um, board members or others that were able to picture it? Was it about having the visuals in advance? Was it about having the projects ready? Um, was it, you know, you know, what were the most um, yeah. effective ways to get, um, particularly the ARPA dollars? Who were mm -hmm. your best champions? And what, what would your advice be for us? Well, one thing that we've been really successful in doing really in 33 years is lobbying the mayor to put money into the parks department budget for capital projects in our Olmstead parks. And the way we have done that is we match funding. So we say, if you put half a million dollars towards this new pavilion in Central Park, we will put in half a million dollars. So it is very hard for the government to turn down free money. Um, so that worked really well for a long time. Um, when I started, we sort of took that to a different level. So for instance, for Chickasaw, we worked with the West Louisville Tennis Club, the Chickasaw Neighborhood Federation and different user groups to talk about the plans. We surveyed the neighbors. What do you wanna see happen? The number one thing was to fix up the lodge and to fix up the bathroom. So that was our priority. So we got letters of support from those different user groups and individuals. We went to the Metro Council person with those letters and said, your constituents want this project. Will you support it? They all said yes. So by the time we got to the mayor, we had the support of the council, which ultimately approves the budget and the neighborhood groups. And we're matching the dollars. So it makes it very hard for them to say no um, in the face of all of that. So um, we have just, we've been really, really successful in lobbying for money for projects. Um, the pond project was those plans were all done years ago. And I go back and forth. In this case, it was nice that they were done years ago because it was ready to be executed and those dollars have to be spent pretty quickly. The con of that is that you get community input to develop all those plans. And when you don't have the money, it sits on a shelf for years. And that's been frustrating because then those neighbors say, well, what about that pond project that we saw the plans for and we went to the meetings? When is that ever happening? And they feel like they've been sort of yeah, led along yeah. again, yeah. you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think it's kind of tricky. Um, yeah. 
Well, that's great. And so the so ultimately, the final decision maker of the allocation of those ARPA dollars w- that was money the city had the authority to allocate. It wasn't yes. city. It was city. It was city dollars. It was city dollars, and we worked very closely with the Parks Department. So the parks department, you know, there was another park project that we had that we knew was going to come in over budget. So we talked to the parks department, what projects are you going to push for in this budget? And then when we have our annual meeting with the mayor, we talked about the budget, you know, numbers that we wanted and projects that we wanted to see included in that. So we did include, uh, I mean, we did lobby the mayor to include funding for the pond project. We do we do similar we do similar things, but it, it seems like there it's it's very good to hear your your um your success in a few ways and the many ways. And I wonder um if you could uh what just for my my concept and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your presentation, Layla, and I'm okay. sure yeah. what percentage of the uh, public park land, city park land in Louisville is under your in in your system? For you. So it's probably about half the land, but yeah. it's 17 parks out of 120. Okay. So it's not as many parks, but we have- Yeah, the but, but they're big. Parks. They're big. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. William, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, following along on that question, you mentioned getting the infrastructure money and mm-hmm. those funds. Could you- Talk a little bit about what that process was like. Sure. So that money all goes to the public parks department. So it doesn't necessarily come to us. So in terms of um, what it's been like to try to spend it, I can't answer that. But um, as I mentioned previously, we did have a number of projects that we really wanted to see funding for. Um, I think the city did a very good job with the ARPA funds in directing it towards parks and neighborhoods that had not seen investment. Um, It went a very long way towards righting wrongs of previous generations. Um, We had projects in our Olmstead parks totaling almost $15 million that received funding in that. So it was a ton of money. Um, You know, pool projects, new community center, the pond. I mean, the pond is two and a half million that's a really hard project to raise funding for. It's so expensive um, for a single thing. So without federal or state funding, things like that are just really difficult to do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I apologize. I have to jump off. I have a 245 call with a foundation. So you can see we're always kind of trying to get more money. (laughs) <laughs> always fundraising. Um, but I really enjoyed being with all of you today and I appreciate your questions and your attentiveness. And um, hopefully you all have my email if you ever want to reach out with any questions. So thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs>